everybody. Hope you've had a good day and a good week. Um, appreciate you being here. And those of you who are watching or will watch on Facebook, uh, welcome. I'm glad that uh, you're joining in with us. <clears throat> so let's start with our prayer time. Uh, are there uh, folks that you would like for us to particularly lift up in prayer tonight? Okay, gotcha, and unspoken, all right, um, we put out a one call yesterday to remember the Palmer family and some things that they have going on in their family, so um, let's lift them up tonight, <clears throat> and you said your whole clan's sick, right, Sean? <laughs> okay. So the, the pose. Yes. Was it something expected or something? Good. Good. Remind me of his name again. Raymond Klaus family. Are you going to be traveling for Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Mamie Hall. Mamie Hall. Mamie Hall. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. Okay, we'll lift him up. I talked to Bobby Beavers yesterday and got a report on his son, Phil Beavers, and um, his tumor has shrunk a little bit. So they, they think the chemo and, and treatment's working, and still he still has some time doing that. So hopefully that can get better, better, and better as well. Anybody else? Sorry? Yeah. I, I mentioned that right before you walked in. Well, I mentioned the, the whole family before you walked in. Like I told you today, I got a negative. Yay! Amen, amen. Good news, good news. All right. And I ask that you would continue to lift my family and me up. Um, just some some lifestyle changes that were kind of being forced upon us. Uh, well, on me, but Jennifer's been a saint and, and with the change of diet and some of the stuff. So um, I want to say a great big thank you to Julie, uh, who brought us up. She, she complained the whole time ahead of time, saying it's going to be bland, bland, bland. But I thought, all of us thought it was delicious. And so thank you very much for your thoughtfulness and your kindness, and um, we really appreciate that. So um, just pray that, that we'll get used to the things that we need to get used to and that I will indeed be able to slow down. Uh, I, I find myself like I'm the only one in the building with no rush on anything, but I, I find myself like walking fast through the building why are you rushing? Why can't you just slow down? And so, uh, as I remember back to last Tuesday morning, I thought, it's worth just slowing down. Uh, but thank you all for your prayers with that. Anybody else lift up tonight? Okay, let's, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that, that you are so, so, so powerful and good and, and that you hear all of our prayers. And we know, really, even before we pray our prayers, that you're already working in the lives of, of those situations that we have on our hearts. And so we thank you for, uh, for your love for the people we love. We thank you for 
uh, the, the way that you work in their lives. And so we do lift up the, these that have been mentioned tonight, the, the unspoken that was mentioned. Lord, you know uh, what's going on. And so we pray that you would provide what is needed in that situation. Uh, we pray for uh, Sean's uncle's family, Raymond Claus, Claus's family. Um, we thank you that he had a, a good, long life, and, but it doesn't make it easier on those who love him who are left behind. And so we, we pray, Lord, that, that you would comfort them and that you would um, provide for them in this time of loss. And I know uh, decisions have to be made with arrangements and funerals and those kinds of things. And so just we pray that you would make that process as simple and easy as possible that you would just bring loved ones and those uh, who would support them in the days ahead for that. Uh, we pray for uh, Mamie Hall and the surgery that she's going to be having tomorrow. Uh, we pray that you would give her peace, uh, that, that you would give her a really good night's sleep tonight and be at peace about this. Uh, we pray for her surgeons and everybody who's going to be uh, involved with this procedure and that, that you would help every step to be done just right and that every move would be just right and that it would do what the surgery is intended to do. Uh, we pray for you to strengthen her body to receive the surgery as, as well as to recover from the surgery. And so we just pray that, that you would uh, guide that whole process, Lord. Uh, we give you thanks for Phil Beaver's situation where the tumor shrinking uh, we'll pray that that would continue going that direction and that you would give them peace and comfort and strength as he's continuing treatments. And Jeff Boggs as well, that, that you would provide healing. Uh, but in the meantime, as you're, as you're working through this process of treatments, that, that you would give them hope and encouragement and strength and uh, support around them. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the Palmer family. You know the situation, and so, Lord, we pray for for healing there, and comfort there, and for wisdom, and discernment, and guidance, and provision. Uh, we, we just pray that, that you would break the chains, that you would break the chains, and, and bring freedom uh, to that scenario. Uh, and, Lord, we pray for Sean and Daryl's family. Thank you that they're starting to feel better, but pray that you would help them to feel all the way better soon and very soon. And Lord, I, I thank you. I, I can't thank you enough for the way that you've worked in my life over the last week, uh, that, um, that you have proven your grace sufficient again and your goodness. Uh, and I'm just so very thankful. And thank you for those who have expressed love and support to my family and me. Uh, we, we are truly blessed, and uh, we do count it a blessing to be a part of this family, this church family, and to have so many friends and family around us as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and so we pray for our time together tonight, Lord, um, as we talk together, uh, spend this time together, uh, lift up our hearts, help us to sense your presence in this place. We, we know that, that you're here with us because you promised that where two or more are gathered, that you're, here, you're there. And um, so we're here with uh, the right motivation, to, to grow closer to you, to learn more about you, to, to grow in our faith. And um, so we, we just put our trust in you and we expect, Lord, for you to, uh, to speak to us through your word and through your spirit and through our time together. So we go ahead and give you thanksgiving for that as well. And so thank you uh, for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, please speak tonight. We are listening. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right, let me pass out our worksheets for tonight. If you will take one and pass it around. And there's way too many, I know, so just whoever's left with them, uh, hold on to them until the end, and I'll grab them back from you at the end. But as, as that's passing around, uh, I've decided to, to move on to our next doctrine in our foundation study. So we uh, have been going through this study called Foundations. It's a doctrinal study looking at 11 major doctrines of our faith. 
And the whole point of it is to see what the Bible has to say about some of the most important topics of life. And so that's what these 11 doctrines do. They, they tell us what God says about the end times or about, about himself or about Jesus or about the Bible. That, that's kind of... I can make the right decision that will consult the Bible for. source of information. So, uh, what I'm holding in my hand is a thimble, and I will go ahead and be honest with you that Jennifer had to dig this out for me. I have never used one of these in my life, and so um, she has, and so she knew where it was and, and found it for me. And so as I hold up this thimble, as small as it is, look at this thimble and think about this thimble. Imagine trying to fit the whole Atlantic Ocean into this thimble. Can you even imagine, uh, I, oh, I'm about to lose the, th I about lost the ocean. Can you imagine that? Oh man, uh, it's hard to even imagine that. Uh, well, that's probably how we might feel sometimes. topic, a really, really big topic. Um, can, can people as inadequate as we are really use something as small as our words to try to describe the greatness of God? Now, it's important for us to try. It's important for us to, to work at that and to gain understanding, but it almost feels futile, doesn't it? God is so great, so much greater than we can fully comprehend. It sounds like an impossible task. So, should we give up and just go home? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If we were left to our own intelligence and our own mere intuition to try to describe God, then um, what we could come up to say about Him... Um, would probably be less than a thimbleful. Uh, so um, we have to go somewhere deeper than just our own thoughts, somewhere deeper uh, than just our own understanding or even the world's understanding around us. And so fortunately, God has given us another source to consider truth about him where he has chosen to reveal himself to us and it's in the Bible. This is the book that he's given us, our perfect guidebook for living. In this book, God tells us about himself. He tells us about his love. as we study the not that we'll just facts are important and they help us and we talked earlier in our study about how facts kind of 
in that process more than just facts. We want to know God himself better in a relational kind of way. And just like uh, you in, in your relationship with your spouse when y'all first met, you probably spent a lot of time together and, and did a lot of stuff together to get to know each other better. That's kind of through this, uh, that we can get to know God better. And um, I, I want it to, to not feel like we're looking at God from a distance, but that he's right here with us, uh, sharing with us uh, himself, his presence, and his, um, his personality, his values, his uh, priorities, all of that stuff. Uh, we want him to teach us uh, for himself. So it's going to be like that Atlantic Ocean right here in the room. Instead of trying to fill it in a thimble, uh, let's imagine that, that we're going for a swim in a study on God and that we're going to be surrounded by him, revealing himself to us and sharing with us all about him and, and helping us to better understand who he is. Uh, so it's not just facts we're looking for. Uh, it's to, to know God in a more powerful and personal way. So I can say with confidence uh, that there's no subject more important for us to talk about on any given day or any given night. Uh, God is the most important thing that we can think about or know about. Uh, life's major. We typically get it backwards. We think that we're the center of the universe and that we're the most important ones to, to think about and ponder, and, uh, but we got it backwards. God is uh, the most important for us to know. Uh, so, in this portion of our study, life changes to gain a deeper sense of God's love for us as our Heavenly Father. Uh, and then two, to act in some new way based on that information, based on that growing relationship with our Heavenly Father. That, that's our objective. Uh, as we launch into this look at the person of God, there's two attitudes for us to, to try to have that are crucial, expectancy and humility. Um, expect that God will do something great in our life today as we talk about who He is and, uh, and as He shows Himself to us. A.W. Tozer is one of my favorite uh, devotional writers of old. I get a, a devotional from, from his literature every morning in an email and read it. Now sometimes it's way deeper than I can understand. He was a deep, deep, deep thinker. Uh, but one time A.W. Tozer wrote, he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So that, does that, that's profound, that's deep, that's rich. The most important thing about us is what comes to mind when we think about God. And so it's important for us to get to know God better. So um, God is so great, and our belief in Him is so important that even the smallest change in our own perspective on who He is and how He acts can transform our, our lives. And that's my hope for me, and that's my hope for you. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I, I'm embarrassed to say this, I get bored with my routine of, of, of God, of church, of stuff like that. Uh, you just kind of get, you find yourself going through the motions, um, not feeling like you're really growing much. And um, I, I get there sometimes, just, Lord, help me to get out of this rut. And so that, that's my prayer for me and for us, that even the tiniest bit of information that God reveals about himself to us will change our lives now in a profound way. That, that he would do something to, to get our attention in a, in a profound way and, and will change our lives. So what you believe about God... Well, this is. Think about the impact that the truth about God can have on your everyday life. What you believe about God sets your moral count, your moral compass, and shapes your attitude toward fortune, 
fame, power, pleasure, everything. Knowing God changes the way you think about everything. And so everything we learn about him has, has a chance to make a profound difference in our lives. Trusting the truth about God strengthens us in times of hardship and pain. Uh, what we know and believe about God keeps us faithful and courageous during difficult times, uh, hard times, uh, troublesome times. Um, it prompts our praise about God. It enhances our worship. Uh, I, I think that is um, my problem sometimes, and maybe our, our church and every church's problem sometimes is in our times of worship, we don't focus on God enough. We kind of get stuck at the, the smaller details of things. And so if we expand our horizons to, to think about how great God really is, it will impact the way we study. Uh, knowing more and more about God and, and learning more and more about God uh, dictates our philosophy in life. It determines our lifestyle. Uh, it gives meaning and significance to our relationships. It shows us when to say yes and when to say no. Uh, knowing God gives us the hope we need to go on to another day uh, in a pretty depressing world. In a pretty depressing culture, knowing God makes a big difference in our lives. It's the foundation upon which everything rests. So, let's have a sense of, expect, uh, sense of expectation that God is going to teach us something about himself uh, during this. That he's going to reveal himself to us or reveal something about himself to us that's going to grow us, that's going to impact our lives. Uh, so expectation is one thing, uh, but also we have to have a humble heart as we study the person of God. Uh, Augustine, uh, an early church leader, uh, once said this. He said, if you can understand it, it's not God. <laughs> and doesn't that make sense? God is greater than we are, so if, if we can fully understand it, then that's not very great. <laughs> it's always blown my mind. I, I think back to um, you know scripture days where they were literally making idols to carry around with them, and that was their God. How dumb is that? You just made that out of piece of wood. You saw the wood that it came from, or the piece of metal that it came from, and you're going to call that God. That just seems completely illogical to me. And so for you to understand God on your own would be like an ant attempting to understand you. Only by God's grace and revelation of himself do we know anything of what he is like and who he is because he has chosen to reveal himself to us. So instead of approaching this study with the desire to figure God out. Instead, let's begin with a humble intention to let God and invite God to beg God to show us something new about himself and to reveal himself in a, in a deeper, richer way to us. Um, you don't have to answer this out loud, but um, have you ever felt like you had to mark it on God? Have you ever felt like you know all there is to know? Have you ever felt like um, you got this? Well, I hope that, that God will prove us wrong if, if we ever have that attitude that, that he is deeper and richer than we can even imagine. And so maybe it's time that we're excited about digging in about who he is and inviting him to reveal himself to us in, in new ways. You know, children have a way of asking the right questions about God. What does God look like? What does God Or how big is God? Big questions. Maybe you remember asking those questions uh, sometime. Maybe you've given up 
on asking those kinds of questions, maybe because we never got satisfactory answers along the way, or maybe we did. Um, but I can't have a way of asking those uh, insightful questions. So today and over the next couple of weeks, let's be kids. Let's think of those imaginative questions of what do we want to know about God, and, and, and be free to ask Him. And let's see what He will reveal to us about Himself. So, Confidence of a five year old, picture they will. So let's have the confidence to us in some new and special ways. So close your eyes and bring to your mind right now. Someone who doesn't understand nuclear physics, computers and lasers, and just sort of a grandfatherly type who's there when you need him? Uh, or uh, do you see pure light? Do you see a uh, king on his throne? Uh, or thunder and lightning? What is it that you see? What is it that you picture uh, when you think of God? And so that's a good starting place for us to, um, to go into a study like this. about God. So anybody bold enough to, to share your images when you think about God? You first, what? Everything we look at. Everything we look at, yeah. Joel? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? You see an old man in his rocker, um, just waiting for that lost child to come back. That that imagery of um, the prodigal son uh, comes to my mind of of a loving father who is waiting for his his uh, hard headed, hard hearted, uh, rebellious kid to, to come back. So. Um, so, as we look at God's existence, uh, we need to remember three key truths. We'll only talk about one of them tonight. Uh, but the three key truths that we need to remember about God's existence. Number one, God is real. Number two, God is revealed. And number three, God is relational. So, at first glance, or first listen, hearing that, uh, they, that might seem simple, simple about God. Uh, these truths, um, these truths form the basis for filling in the picture. So let's talk about the first one. God is real. God is real. Uh, God is not just a character in a story. God is not just a character in some fairy tale. God is as real and honestly more real than any of us sitting in this room or anybody who's watching out there in Facebook world. Um, so how do we know that God exists? How do we know that God exists? Now, maybe in school you had to study the philosophical arguments for God's existence. Maybe not, probably not. In college, uh, I was a religion major, so I, I had to learn some of these concepts, philosophy, theology, uh, the ontological argument for God, the teleological argument for God, the cosmological argument for God. Um, those, are, those are big words. While these arguments make it clear that logically... There's some kind of higher being that exists. They also really make it confusing. Uh, even saying those kinds of words uh, just make you want to give up and, and look somewhere else uh, for God. And so uh, the Bible, on the other hand, 
is much simpler. The, the Bible gives us uh, stories, and the, God give, uh, the Bible gives us principles. Uh, but interestingly, the Bible does not present arguments for God's existence. It assumes God's existence. It's written from the perspective that God exists. It just automatically assumes it. And so uh, we all have moments perhaps when, uh, when we've thought, you know, is this stuff about God real? Uh, or am I just fooling myself? Or is this too good to be true? Or um, we, we sometimes have doubts. Uh, but uh, there are good reasons uh, why some 96% of Americans believe that there is a personal God. Um, to the vast majority, the fact that there is a God is just intuitively obvious. You look around and you can tell that there is a God. Um, so here are three reasons why it's intuitive for us to know that God exists. Uh, number one, we see God's creativity in what he has made. We see his creativity in what he's made. Um, we see passages like Psalm 19, 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Amen? We, we learn Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. We're, Paul tells us in Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature, these things have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. That's, that's important to know. Men are without excuse. That means God is righteous when he judges uh, someday uh, people's rejection of him. They're without excuse. They look at the sun and the sky and the stars and the trees and the oceans and the mountains and the rivers and the animals and the people and it's clear that something greater than ourselves put it into place. Now, I understand, you know, through the last hundred plus years, uh, people have done our best to deny that and to reject that. But in the end, Paul is right in Romans. We can tell just from looking around. You have to go out of your way to deny it. So look up into the sky on a clear night in a field, uh, out away from, from lights, and that's been a... a a joy for me as we've moved out here to Bear Creek and uh, at night when I'm walking the dog, just getting to look up and, and see all the stars. And, and the, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And so but you do that and wow, something in us is drawn in those moments to see the greatness of God in the greatness of what he's made. It, it's just undeniable, undeniable. Uh, do you realize just how vast, just how big this universe is? Avery Willis uh, gives us this picture. He wrote, now try to, try to go on this visual trip with me as I read through this. He said, step on a rocket with me and catch a glimpse of the greatness of God. We travel at the speed of light. 186,282 miles per second. As we blast off, our seats afford us a clear view of the earth. One second later, earth has dropped away until it appears no larger than a huge balloon. In two seconds, we have shot past the moon and stolen a glance at the now famous moonshot of the earth. Eight and a half minutes later, we pass the sun. Earth appears to be a speck 93 million miles away 
in the darkness of space. Five hours later, we leave our solar system and can no longer distinguish Earth from myriads of other planets and stars. After four years of travel at the speed of light, we zip by the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. For almost 100,000 years, we travel across the Milky Way, our own galaxy. After that, we travel another 1,500,000 years before we reach the Great Nebula, most distant of the six other galaxies in what astronomers call the local group. Up to this point, we might compare our journey to a family traveling across country whose five-year-old asks before they get out of town, how much farther is it? In the great vastness of space, we must travel at least 12 billion years at the speed of light before we begin to reach the area of the universe that cannot be seen with telescopes from our planet. And who knows how much lies beyond. Yet, Isaiah says, God hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span. Isaiah forty twelve. God measures space by the width of his hand. So that's pretty doggone amazing when we think about this universe that we live in. And that universe was created by Almighty God, who is way greater than that. So yes, we can learn a little bit about how great God is when we look around at his marvelous creation. We can intuitively know that God exists by the creation around us. Number two. We can, we can know that God exists because we see God's thumbprint on human history. We see his thumbprint on human history. As the Apostle Paul wandered around Athens, looking at all the altars to the false gods, and to their ideas of gods, those various idols, he noticed one that was to an unknown God. And so... Uh, in his brilliance and his passion for the gospel and his love for people, the Apostle Paul later there in Athens uh, debated with some of the philosophers there uh, who really enjoyed debating and arguing and such. And he gave them this argument for God in Acts 17, 22 to 28. Paul in, the, in that debate said, Men of Athens... I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them, and the exact places where they should live, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And so what Paul was doing was explaining God's involvement in history. God's involvement with mankind. History really is his story. History is his story. Even while he waits to finish the story, it's very evident that God is the author and director, and the sooner we can figure this out, the main character in the story that we call life. Sociologist Grace Davy cites a recent survey, well, it's not recent anymore, a, 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 an older survey 
that asked Britons whether they believed in God. Most respondents in that survey said that they did believe in God. The next question on the survey was, do you believe in a God who can change the course of events on earth? A popular response was, no, just the ordinary one. And we can laugh at that statement, but isn't that how we live our lives? (laughs) That's definitely how mankind today lives our lives, as if God doesn't exist. He might be God out there somewhere, but we don't really care as long as we do what we want to do when we want to do it. And so um, uh, that will turn out bad (laughs) in the end when we ignore God's part in history. Uh, Acts 17, uh, there where the Apostle Paul was debating, reminds us that there is nothing ordinary about God. He determines both the times and the places of world history. He sets the course of events on earth. He determined when this earth began, and it's on his timetable that it will come to an end. He alone decided when the world would start fresh with a flood. He decided when Abraham would go to the promised land, when Moses would lead the Israelites' slaves out of Egypt. Um, Going through the Old and New Testaments, you would find hundreds of examples of God's being at the helm of human history. It's still true today. Um, And it's important for us to believe that. Because it sure doesn't look like it sometimes, right? You watch the news and and you kind of wonder, what in the world's going on? Where is God in all of this? Well, it's still true today. God is in control of history. Um, He may allow an evil leader or an injustice to exist for a time, but never to prevail ultimately. God decides when and how a Hitler will fall. Uh, God puts an Abraham Lincoln at the right place in the right time. He decided when communism would unravel in the Soviet states. And as Acts 17 tells us, he does it so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. And so we can know that God exists because of his involvement in human history. And then third, we can know God exists because we can see in our own lives. And it's important for us to keep a journal or something like that, to at least occasionally go back and, and and remember how God has worked in your life. Those are are good and healthy reminders for us. And so let's look at a story where God was very, very much involved in a personal way. It's one of my favorite stories uh, coming out of 1 Kings 18, 24 to 39. The story of Elijah and his battle with the false prophets, the, the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. So I'm just going to kind of summarize it instead of reading that passage. But for years, Elijah had been dealing with and battling with the false prophets of a false god called Baal. Uh, Passionate about defeating their influence on the nation of Israel, he finally challenged these false prophets to a test or to a contest uh, on Mount Carmel. 450 prophets of Baal showed up, and if I'm remembering right, it seems like there were at least that many or more of a of false prophets of, a, of another. It's not coming to me right now. I didn't go back to that passage specifically for that, but so you're looking at probably 800 and something prophets that are standing doing battle against one prophet of God, and so for Elijah, that's what could be called pretty poor profit margins, uh, 800 and something to one. Uh, Anyway, God, uh, Elijah put the bet on the right right God uh, who proved himself in that. So here's the battle. Uh, They were challenged to to build altars, to put a bull on the altar, 
and to um, get it all prepared and everything, and then to pray to Baal uh, to bring fire down from heaven to burn up the altar. And so he, get, he lets them go first. And they're carrying on, hooping and hollering and shouting and screaming and praying and dancing and cutting and you name it, they're doing it, trying to get their God to uh, prove that he is real and that he uh, is going to act on their prophets, on those prophets' behalf. And they carry on for a long, 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 long time. And at some point, Elijah starts taunting them. Maybe, maybe he's asleep. Or maybe he's using the bathroom, or maybe maybe he's you know just taunting them, and so obviously never responds because you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip, you can't squeeze miracles out of a false god. So then Elijah's turn, and he has them pour water on everything, just douse it all with water, and build a trench around it, and they put so much water on on his sacrifice that it filled that trench up, and then. Uh, Elijah goes to praying and whoosh, fire comes from heaven and, and burns up the sacrifice and everything on the altar and even laps up all the water that had filled the trench, proving that the God of heaven was the only real God in that scenario. And so that's a, that's a pretty amazing uh, personal encounter with the living God. He proved himself real in a very personal way uh, through his prophet Elijah and all of those who witnessed that. So God works in clear and personal ways in our lives. Now your experience likely has never been as dramatic as Elijah's and, and this with the contest with the other false prophets. But it was just as real. Uh, you may have seen his power at work in a restored relationship. You may have seen his power at work in a habit that he helped you to overcome. You may have seen him working in a personal way uh, to give you peace in a, in a stressful situation uh, when you were overwhelmed or worried. Or maybe he's given you courage uh, to take some step of faith, or maybe he's given you wisdom to make a, a good decision. Every believer can say that we have experienced the action of God, the personal action of God, in his sending his son, Jesus Christ, um, to die on the cross for our forgiveness. His action on the cross was dramatic and powerful, and personal. Uh, it was not just a historical event. The cross was God's personal action in your life. Jesus died for you. And Jesus rose from the dead for you. And Jesus taught his disciples and, and, and brought about the church for you. Jesus, God, gave us the Bible for you. It's very, very personal how he has worked in our lives. Unfortunately, it's easy for us to forget what God has done. Sometimes we get distracted. It's easy to get distracted. Sometimes we forget. Uh, you remember what Elijah did uh, just a, a day or two after this humongous event where God proved himself? He went and moaned and groaned and cried uh, that, that he was the only one. He, he, Lord, just kill me. I'm the only one left. Uh, he went into a depressed state, uh, forgetting what God, this amazing thing. I mean, can you even imagine it? Uh, I, I think like uh, back to the, you know, the whole Old Testament story of the Israelites out wandering in the desert and um, God doing miracle after miracle after miracle for them and they keep forgetting and they keep getting distracted about they're hungry or they're thirsty uh, or whatever. And so um, we're, not, we're not immune to that. Uh, we, can, we can get distracted too. We can, we can forget uh, what, how great God is and, and how good God is sometimes too. Uh, we easily forget the power 
of what God has done and too often get caught up in the details of our daily lives. But faith grows when we take time to remind ourselves of God's actions in our lives. How has God worked or how is God working in your life? And it's important to, to ask ourselves that question often, just, just so we'll have that, that healthy, true perspective. Because the truth is, even when we're in that depressed, moaning, moping state, God's still working in our lives, even if we can't see it, even if we can't, can't comprehend it. And so let me challenge you and challenge myself to, um, to build some kind of, of habit or routine to, to look for God working in our lives, to remind ourselves of God working in our lives. Anybody want to share tonight of how God's working in your life, a way that you've sensed that God has, has worked or is working in your life? I can tell you he has, um, he has opened my eyes in the past week uh, of how um, how much I take for granted the people I love and, and the situations in my life. Uh, he's given me, uh, and I, I know I, I don't want to, this, this is, I hope it's not inappropriate. I certainly don't want it to be inappropriate. But um, one of the evenings after I got home uh, from the hospital last week uh, was a day or two after the accident that had happened in Siler City. And I, I, I saw your post of, of who it was. Now, I, I didn't know him personally, but man, it struck me with, with being so close to when what had happened to me. Um, now, I'll be honest with you. The whole time that my stuff was happening last Tuesday, not one single time, even in the hospital, not one single time uh, did it occur to me that I'm dying or I could die from this. I think that was God's grace covering me, uh, that it wasn't even on my radar that this is a, something that could lead to death. Uh, but boy, after I got home, and after I saw that post and, and learned of that situation, and just how, how freakish and, and, and odd that whole thing happened, boy, it made me appreciative of, of what God had done for me, that... Um, he put the right EMS people in my life. He put, the, he put my wife in my life to, to be there for me at the right moment to, to make that phone call and to be there to support me and the EMS ones that knew what they were doing and the doctors and the surgeons and the nurses. and God, God is involved in our lives. It really opened my eyes. And so, Anybody else? Any, any stories for you of... How God has worked in the past or how God is working now? I know it's awkward to share in a, in a crowd, but... Oh, you're sweet. I, I honestly believe that too, uh, that, that he brought you to me or that you brought, he brought you to us. That um, we, we needed you as much as you needed, needed us. So, um, yeah, thank, thank you for that. That's sweet. That blessed my heart. Anybody else? So here's the important thing to remember. God is real. God exists. We can see that he exists by the creation around us. We know that he exists from his involvement in human history. And we know we exist from his personal involvement in each of our lives. You know, he's not done with us. God's not done with you yet. Uh, somebody made that statement to me after my circumstances. He must not be done with you yet. But that's true for you too. God's not done with you yet. God's not done with Sandy Branch Baptist Church yet. God is still very real and God is still working and involved. And so um, may we be faithful at giving him glory. And which help, First we have to recognize who he is and what he's doing and then give him the praise and the worship and the glory. And God is good. So um, what's the one thing that for you makes it seem as if God is in the room with you? What makes God seem the most real to you? Is it seeing what he's made, looking at creation? 
Is it looking at human history or considering human history? Is it thinking about how God has worked in your life? Being in church? Reading the Bible? Serving others? Anybody want to have a go at that one? How does, how, what is it that, that you're doing or uh, what environment are you in where you just know that you know that you know that God is real and God is present? Anybody want to share with that one and we'll close up. Being with God's people, worshiping and studying together. And Amen. Amen. This, this church has seen some, some amazing days. I mean, it's, as old as this church is, just think of all the different people who have been a part of this church family. A lot of them, a lot of them out there and up there. Uh, but um, boy, this church has impacted and God has impacted the lives of many people through the context of this church family. Amen, amen. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's close with a prayer, and I bid you God's blessings. Now, let me remind you, and those of you who are, who are watching or will watch on Facebook, this coming Sunday, we're going to have Sunday school in our classes, normal, but we're going to do worship outside. We're going to worship out uh, in the... I don't know if you want to call that the front or the back, but out that way uh, of the sanctuary. And so you're, you're welcome to do it a couple of ways. Um, you can bring a chair, and we'll have some chairs available, I'm sure. Or you can bring a lone chair uh, and sit up. Or you can sit in your car uh, if, if you sit out here. We're not going to be broadcasting it over the radio. So you won't be able to hear like on the radio in your car. Uh, so if you park back that away, uh, you won't be able to hear as good. So I, I recommend uh, you sitting out here or parking out here on this side so that you can hear the speakers. Uh, Richard and I gave it a go with three different sound systems trying to plug in, and it's just too, it's, it's more trouble than it's worth, honestly. So, and it's going to have feedback. So let's sit out here. And it's also going to be Lord's Supper. And so, um, it's going to be different probably than what you're used to with Lord's Supper. Normally you would have deacons passing out the Lord, the, the elements to you. Uh, we're just going to have, have, it, have the, the trays sitting somewhere around and encourage you to grab the packet uh, before we start the worship service. And um, so it'll be a little bit different that way. If you know that you're not going to be here Sunday, number one, shame on you. No, I'm just playing. Uh, but if, if you know that you're not going to be here, but that you're going to watch us on Facebook, go ahead and be thinking about how you can get your own bread and juice and stuff ready for the Lord's Supper as well. So just a, a, um, an advertisement. Uh, it, it's been a long, it feels like it's been a long time since a lot of us have been together to worship. And so that's, that's what we're wanting to do with doing it outside is to, to create an environment where we'll feel safe being somewhat close to each other and outside. And so um, that's, that's the goal, to have as many uh, people come together uh, next Sunday as possible. So, okay, let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much that you have proven that you are real, that you have proven that you exist. Uh, whether it's through the creation around us as we just look at the stars and the moon and the, the mountains and the flowers and the animals and consider our own bodies. Uh, we know that you're real because we see your hand in human history. And we know that you're real because of your personal involvement in each of our lives. Thank you for, thank you for proving yourself. We worship you. We thank you. We dedicate ourselves to you. We pray that you would bless our church and every single person and family who's a part of our church. Help us to grow in our faith and our understanding of you. Help us to grow in our love for each other. Help us to grow in our love for this community. Help us to grow in our love for, for people in general. Um, it feels easier said than done sometimes, but uh, you love everybody. 
and so work through us to do the same. And so we, we just thank you and worship you and dedicate ourselves to you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you all so much. Hope you have a great rest of the night and a great rest of the week. And we will see you soon and very soon.